On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So who is my neighbor sounds like a pretty simple question, right? I mean, I think about our family. Who is my neighbor? Well, Robbie and Ashley, we had dinner with them last night. They live next door. Norma's across the street. Paul rents the place on the other side of us. But think about it a little bit more deeply. Like, how would you answer that if somebody asked you that question? Especially if you weren't quite sure why they were asking. You know, you didn't know what their motivations were. You might, ah, I don't know, ask for some clarification. Say, well, why do you want to know? Or, or what exactly do you mean by neighbor? Well, in the passage that we just heard read from Luke 10, someone asks Jesus that very question. They say, who is my neighbor? And do you know how Jesus replies to that question? He does it with a story, which when you stop and think about it is a little weird. I mean, because if we were going through life and we asked somebody a question and they answered with a story, that would seem very strange to us. It's like, for example, you go into your boss's office because they've just, uh, they've just given you new, uh, a work project. And you're like, hey, can you give me some details about this project? And they say, details about the new project. Once upon a time, right? Or when I go home from work, and I'm like, Martha, what are we having for dinner tonight? And she says, dinner tonight? It was a dark and stormy night. I mean, we just, we just don't expect stories. Um, but that's Jesus for you. I mean, he would often use stories to answer people's questions and to try to teach them something about who God is and, and how we follow God in this world. And this morning, we're continuing on in a sermon series where we're looking together at some of those stories that Jesus taught, what we know as the parables. And in this series, we've talked about some of the challenges that we have as 21st century people in making sense of these stories, right? One of the real challenges for us is that Jesus told these stories to a first century audience, and he used a lot of details and references to their lives and to the first century world. And for us, living 2,000 years later, sometimes we don't make the connections. We don't necessarily hear these stories or understand them in the same way that they did because we have to work to understand some of these first century references. So that's one reason why it can be challenging. Uh, I think one of the other reasons why these stories can be challenging, quite honestly, is that sometimes we are just so familiar with them that, that we kind of miss the point. So, for example, this morning, the story that we're going to look at, the story of the Good Samaritan, is one of the most well-known stories that Jesus told. And now when Jesus told this story for the very first time, it was shocking to his audience. It was really scandalous to them. But for us, you know, we've heard about the Good Samaritan so much, and they made like a Veggie Tales thing about it. So for us, when we hear it, we just don't hear the shock that the original audience would have heard because we're so used to it. But we have to remember that Jesus taught using these very relatable but, but shocking stories because he wanted to challenge his audience. He wanted to challenge them to, to think differently to act differently, to live differently, right? He used these first century details that they knew to, to grab their attention, to draw them in. And then his stories often had this dramatic turn in them. And in that turn, he would take this challenge of the way they needed to leave and just sort of lay it on their lap because he was always trying to get them to respond in some way. So for me, I think, okay, as a 21st century person, when I'm trying to read these stories and make sense of them and how do they speak to my life today, I've just figured out that there's one really good question to ask. Right? When you look at these stories, when you read them, the question to always ask is, okay, how did Jesus want his original audience to respond? Because right? if you can do the work to really understand what is it that he's wanting to, to get his original audience to do, well, then it becomes pretty easy once you've done that work to think, all right, well, how does that message apply to our lives today? And what does that mean that Jesus wants us to do today? Because the way that he was calling them to respond is almost always exactly the same way that he's calling us to respond today. So that's what we're going to do. Today, what I want to invite you to do is turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at this story that many of us are probably familiar with. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, you can grab a red one from those seats around you, and you can turn to the page number that's written there up on the screen so we can track along. Um, but to make sense of what's going on in the story, we, we have to pull back a little bit and look at the context. Look at what was going on the day that Jesus told that story to understand why he's telling it. And those are the very same verses that we heard read in the video, but I think they bear repeating. So let's start off looking at this in verse 25. 
It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the law, he replied, and how do you read it? So the expert answers, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and, and who is my neighbor? So one of the things we need to remember is at, at this time when Jesus was teaching, there are all sorts of rabbis and teachers who are traveling around and they're teaching. It was very common you know, for somebody to gather a crowd, and the crowd would ask that rabbi to weigh in with his view on you know, some of the topics of the day. That's what this author is doing here. There are a lot of different um, opinions about what you needed to do to gain eternal life. So in a similar way, it would be like if, um, if like people are running for the city council and there's like a town hall with all the candidates. You might go and you might have one question that you want to hear all the different candidates weigh in on that issue so you can see what their view is. It's kind of what's going on here. The expert of the law says, Jesus, this question, eternal life, what's your take? Well, Jesus realizes that this guy is an expert in the law and he says, well, he's probably got an opinion on this. So he says, well, what do you think? He says, you've got to love God with everything you've got and love your neighbors yourself. Jesus says, that's a great answer, right? You do that and you'll live. But this, this is where the story gets juicy, right? Because the guy just can't leave well enough alone. So he's like, well, I got another question for you, Jesus. Um, he says that he wants to justify himself, so he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, most people, most scholars, when they look at this, they, they think what the guy is trying to do here is he's trying to get Jesus to sort of get the, the narrowest definition of neighbor that he possibly can be. And that's the interpretive approach that Eugene Peterson takes. He did a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And if you look at how he paraphrased this verse, he puts it this way. He says, looking for a loophole, the teacher of the law asked, and uh, just how would you define neighbor? Right? I think what he wants is he wants to know, okay, who exactly is my neighbor so that I have a free pass to just completely ignore everybody else who is not my neighbor. Right? He's wanting Jesus to make his list of who he has to love as small as it possibly can be. And when you look at the story that Jesus tells, that is absolutely how Jesus understands his intention, right? He understands what this guy is going to do, so he tells a story that is meant to address the loophole that he's looking for. So let's look at this story, the story a lot of us know, the Good Samaritan, starting in verse 30. It says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man... He passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So this is one of those moments where getting a little bit of background on the first century stuff can help us make sense of this. Because the story talks about people and places that were very well known in the first century, but that we need a little bit of help to really flesh that out. So let's think about it. Let's start with the people, right? So it talks about two different people in here, a priest and a Levite. Now, what you need to know is that both priests and Levites were professional religious workers in that day. Uh, you think about the Levites, for example. Uh, the Levites worked in the temple, right? They, they played a key role sort of in the, the temple system. They were the people who administered the law. They led the music in the, in the temple. They assisted the priests in sacrifice. It, you can think of them almost as like the administrative and support staff of the temple structure and the religious system that was centered there. And to do their work, the Levites worked in partnership with the priests, right? The priests were the people who actually performed the sacrifices in the temple, among other things. And one of the things that's interesting about being a priest in the first century is that there were an awful lot of them at that time. Scholars think there were about 18,000 priests in Israel at this time, which is like way more priests than there are like priest job duties to do. So the way they handled this is they organized the priests in 24 different divisions. And each division spent two weeks in the city of Jerusalem taking care of sort of priestly duties in the temple. And all the rest of the year, most of them lived outside of Jerusalem, and they just tended to other things and other duties. And this is where the geography part of the story starts to become pretty important. Now, if all these priests didn't live in Jerusalem, where do you think that at least some of them lived? Right, first century documents by writers like Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, say that one of the most popular places for these priests to live was in the city of Jericho, because it wasn't too far away from Jerusalem. Josephus thinks that about half of the 24 divisions of priests actually lived there. So if you think about it, Jericho is it's like a bedroom community for the priests and the Levites and the people who have to work in the city of Jerusalem, but, you know, like, rent's too high or traffic's too bad or something like that. It's like people who live in Salem because they don't want to live in Portland. It's kind of what's going on here. So this road between Jericho and Jerusalem 
this is the commute that these people have to make. And it turns out that their commute is really not very easy. Right, so the road between Jerusalem and Jericho is 17 miles long. Jericho is about 17 miles east of Jerusalem. And to get from Jericho to Jerusalem, you have to ascend about 2,000 feet. So if you look at a picture of what that road looks like, you think about 2,000 feet, right? There's a lot of switchbacks. There's a lot of blind curves. There's not a lot of civilization or development in this area at this time, which is why it was the perfect place, if you were a robber, to wait and try to waylay people who were on the road, right? There's not a lot of cops and first responders out there. And because of that, right, this road really had a reputation in the first century of being a pretty dangerous place, a place where you could run into trouble. And and that's exactly what happens in this story, right? The story starts off, a guy's going down that road, he gets robbed, he gets left for dead there on the side of the road. And then, this is where you need to put yourself in the mindset of a first century audience as best you can. So Jesus says that a priest comes along and sees this guy. And if you're the first century audience, you probably immediately think, oh, good, right? Priests are really good guys. They're religious leaders. The priest, of course, is going to stop and is going to help out. But what does he do? He steps to the other side of the road and just keeps on going. So the audience is like, okay, what's going on? Well, then Jesus says a Levite comes. Like, well, good, Levites. They're really good religious people too. I'm confident the Levite is going to do the right thing. But he doesn't help the man out either. So what's going on here? Um, I think that Jesus names these two men first because these are the very kind of people that his audience assume would step up and help, right? If Jesus were telling this story today, I try to imagine, okay, who would it be? It wouldn't be priests and Levites because that's not part of our world. But maybe in our world today, if Jesus were telling this story, it would be a a pastor or like a, a church volunteer who comes down the road, right? Or maybe it would be the mayor or a civic leader who comes down the road. Or it'd be like an ER nurse or an ER physician, right? If Jesus were telling this story today, the first two people that he would mention would be people that immediately we think, of course they're going to help. Of course they're going to jump up and do that. But what do these two men do? Right? Instead of doing what the audience expects them to do, they choose not to help the man, right? They see him. They see that there's a need there, and they just keep moving. And, and some people, some scholars, when they look at this, you know, for 2,000 years, people have talked about the story, and they try to figure out, well, what was going on with those guys? What was, what was the motivation for doing that? And they try to figure out, why would these seemingly good people just move on? And some people, when they look at this, think, okay, maybe what was going on, maybe that the priest and the Levite, they didn't know the guy was still alive. Maybe they thought he was dead, and they realized if they go over and help him, if they touch a corpse, they're going to be ceremonially unclean. Right, because that was part of the Jewish law at that time. If you touched a dead body, you were impure and unclean for seven days. And if you're a priest or a Levite, like being ceremonially clean, that's kind of important as far as being able to do your job. So maybe that's their motivation. Or, or maybe, and this is the one that I relate to more, um, you know, maybe they're just tired and they want to get home. Right? Remember what the text says? The text says they're going down from Jerusalem back to Jericho. If all that background information is true, maybe they've just finished their week of service in the temple and they just want to go home and see their wife and kids, right? And they see this guy on the side of the road and they think, oh man, oh man, if I get involved in this mess, who knows how long this delay is going to be, right? But whatever the, the motivations are, just look at what Jesus does in the story. Look at the way he tells the story. He's such a good storyteller. He tells a story, and, you know, the first guy's coming along, and the audience, their expectation that he's going to do something, and then it goes away. He moves on. So the second person comes along, and they're like, okay, he's the one that's going to help out, and no, he moves along. So at this point, right, the audience, they've heard stories before, just like we know jokes and stories. They're like, it's always the third guy, right? You know, it's like three guys walk into a bar, whatever the joke is, it's always the third one that's kind of the punchline. So they say, all right, Jesus, I get it. The priest went by, he didn't help. The Levite went by. I know what's going to happen next. Guy number three is going to come along. He's probably like a Jewish farmer. Jesus is trying to make a point about the religious elite of the day and how we all have a calling, right? Some good Jewish guy is going to come along and be the hero of this story. And, you know, they're, they're right and they're wrong. They're right that the, the story really hinges on the third guy and he's the hero. But they're wrong when they think he's Jewish, right? So you keep reading and the text says this. It says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Okay, so it is right here 
that I think the fact that we are so familiar with this story really begins to get in the way and we miss the point. Because we need to talk for a minute about Samaritans. So if I say the word Samaritan, what is the very first word that kind of pops into mind for you, an adjective that would go with the word Samaritan? Yeah, good. Right? For most of us, there was a smart aleck in the first service who was like, hospital. I'm like, well, fine. <laughs> We'll get there. We'll get to that point, right? But for most of us, most of us who aren't doctors, you know, most of us, the normal people, we think about the word that comes to mind is Good Samaritan, right? Like we live in a world where there is something called the Good Samaritan Club, which I think is a bunch of RV owners who have like committed to helping out stranded motorists on the side of the road. Or you think about states, most states now have Good Samaritan laws, which says like, you know, if you come across a wreck and you, you pull the guy out, you know, they're going to... You know, good, if you remember Seinfeld, they all go to prison at the end of that show because they break a Good Samaritan law. They don't help out when they can. Or, the doctor was right, you know, think about in our own community, right? Our hospital is named after this guy, right? If we need to get your appendix out or something, right? You go to the emergency room at Good Sam. Like, for us, when we think Samaritan, we think Good Samaritan, this helpful, friendly guy. But that is not how first century Jewish people thought about Samaritans, right? First century Jews hated Samaritans. They hated Samaritans, and the feeling was mutual, right? Samaritans, okay, if you don't know, Samaritans were an ethnic group that lived in the land of Israel, and their history goes back about 700 years before Jesus was born. So in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire comes in and just decimates the northern kingdom of Israel, wipes out pretty much everybody who was living in the ten tribes there, and then when they're done conquering the land, most of the army leaves, but some of the Assyrian soldiers stay behind, and over time, those Assyrian soldiers begin to intermarry with the few Jewish people who survived that assault. And their children, over time, as they grew, those are the people who became the Samaritans. Right? And over the centuries that passed, they developed their own cultural traditions, their own religious practices, their own ethnic identity. And the Jews absolutely hated them. Right? They viewed them as kind of half-breeds. They viewed them as traitors to the faith who had turned their back on the right way to really follow the one true God. And they were not shy about expressing how they felt about it. All right, so a rabbi from around that time said this. He said, he that eats the bread of the Samaritans is like to one that eats the flesh of swine. Right? And Jewish people are not big on pork products, right? So you know that that's what's going on here. <laughs> another, rabbi, another rabbi said, okay, here's the deal. If you want to, you can hire a Samaritan for the day, have them work out in your field all day long, and then not pay them. God is totally fine with you stiffing them because they're really just Samaritan dogs anyway. Right? And if you think about it, right, over the centuries, the Samaritans and the Jews, they just kept doing things to each other that just amped up this tension and this animosity. And we know from the historical evidence that we have that things were particularly bad between these groups in the first century at the time Jesus was born. Right? And that's because about nine years before Jesus was born, right around the time of the Passover, some Samaritans broke into the temple and they scattered human bones all over it. Right? That's something that would defile the temple, right? the center of religious life and identity for the Jewish people, and they had desecrated it in that way. And people are still ticked about that in the days of Jesus. And in fact, you see that even in the very words of his disciples. So we're reading from Luke chapter 10. You go back one chapter to Luke chapter 9, and there's this time when Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling through Samaria, and they need a place to stay for the night. So they go to this village like, hey, you know, is there like a Motel 6 here or something? Can we stay? And they won't let them come into town. And the disciples are so mad. This is what they do. They say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? <laughs> right? They're not just leaving a bad Yelp review or something like that. Right? They decide they want to wipe them. They want to, kill, they want to murder an entire village because they didn't give them a place to stay. Right? That's how Jewish people felt about Samaritans in the first century. So then imagine what it would have been like for those first century Jewish listeners to find out that the hero of the story is the Samaritan. It's not the priest who does the right thing. It's not the Levite that does the right thing. It's this huge shock for the audience, right? It was the enemy who was the hero of the story. It wasn't their friend. It wasn't the person who looked like them, thought like them, acted like them. It was somebody that was their enemy that was the hero of the story. And again, I try to think, okay, if Jesus were here today, if he were up here uh, in telling the story, who would the third person be in the story that Jesus tells us? Who would the hero be, right? Would it be somebody that we see as an enemy of our nation? You know, is it like an ISIS fighter or somebody in the North Korean army or something like that? Or, or just think about how, how completely divided our nation is right now along political lines. 
Would Jesus tell the story in such a way so that the hero of the story is somebody whose uh, political views and social agenda is something that you can't stand? Right? Maybe for you, the, the hero of the story is somebody who works for Planned Parenthood. Right? Or maybe it's somebody who wears a MAGA hat and goes to Trump rallies. Or maybe it is somebody who is just hoping against hope that they will actually impeach Trump and we can move on. Right? We all have people in our world that we feel are opposed to the things that matter most to us. So think about the shock that you would feel if it was that person who Jesus held up as the hero of the story that he's telling you today. Right? Because that's the kind of shock that the first audience would have had. The, the story ends with just this draw-dopping moment, like it's the Samaritan that's the hero. But remember, Jesus doesn't tell these stories to shock people just for shock's sake. He wants to challenge them to do things differently. And that's how the story ends, right? So he tells the story, and then he goes back to the expert of the law, right? He said, oh, you wanted to know who your neighbor was, right? And he says, well, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, uh, the one who had mercy on him. I mean, look at this. He cannot even bring himself to say the word Samaritan, right? He says, oh, it was the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise, right? It all started with this really simple question, who is my neighbor? And after the story ends, the answer to that question just got a whole lot bigger, right? Jesus seems to be saying to this guy, you know what? You came here hoping that what I would say would let you put a limit on the way that you showed love to other people, but you cannot do that. I'm calling you to live in such a way that you see that every single person is your neighbor. You don't get to put limits on who you love. And that's the message, right? The challenge that he gave to them that we have to wrestle with today because that's the challenge that he's giving us today. And I have to tell you, just if I'm being really honest, I think this parable is incredibly annoying. I mean, it really is. I'm only half kidding about that because in this parable, Jesus doesn't say what I really want Jesus to say. I mean, in a lot of ways, I am like the teacher of the law. I just want Jesus to give me the short list of people that I have to love and the things that I need to do. And he leaves this so open-ended. You see, at its core, what I think is, is difficult about this story is that Jesus takes a question about a noun and he answers by turning it into a verb, right? So the law expert comes, he's like, Jesus, I need you to define this word, this noun, neighbor for me. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus essentially says, all right, well, you want to know who your neighbor is? I'll tell you how to find out. Go out there and be a neighbor. Why don't you start neighboring the people around you? And while you're at it, make sure you don't just limit your neighboring to what's already comfortable for you. Don't limit the neighboring that you do to the people who agree with you about everything or look like you or you feel like are on your side, the people you're comfortable with. See, love doesn't let you narrowly define who your neighbor is because we're called to love everybody. It's an idea that's reflected in how one scholar summarized the, the whole point of the story this way. He said, one cannot define one's neighbor. One can only be a neighbor. And, you know, in some ways, when you look at this story, I, I think you can actually look at this story as a commentary on which of all the different laws that are out there in the Old Testament are, is the most important law to follow. Like, if you really want to give the priest and the Levite the benefit of the doubt, this is how you look at the story. You, you put yourself in their shoes. They're walking down the road. They see this guy. He might be dead. And they think, okay, there's a lot of different laws out there. What is my responsibility right now? Because there were a lot of laws in the Old Testament that said you have to do certain things to stay ceremonially clean, right? Like if you touch a human corpse, you are going to be unclean for seven days. And again, as we've seen for these guys, staying clean, that's an important part of the job description for them. So they've got this law out there. But they also know that the Old Testament has this law in it that says you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. And loving your neighbor might involve helping somebody who's on the side of the road and isn't dead. In fact, loving your neighbor might involve, even if the guy is dead, fulfilling the custom of actually burying a corpse. If you were to just come across a corpse somewhere that was unattended, it was your duty to bury it because one of the worst things you could do was just leave this body that was created in the image of God out there for the birds. So you look at this, right, and you think, okay, maybe that's what's going on in their minds. They're trying to figure out, I I've got some different things that are pressing on me. Which of these laws is most important? Which law should take priority here? And Jesus' answer to that question is crystal clear, right? The command to love your neighbor wins. It wins every time. It even, for these religious workers, it even takes precedence over their desire to keep themselves ceremonially clean so they can be of the best possible service to God in the temple. 
And, you know, in that sense, what Jesus says here, it is perfectly consistent with everything else that he teaches in his ministry. Uh, at one point, there's a story recorded in John 13 as Jesus is about to leave the world, and, and he tells his disciples, hey, you know all those 613 commands in the Old Testament? I've got a new command that you need to follow if you want to truly live as my disciples. So he says this. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. And then he gives a little sort of clarification on what, what does it mean to love one another? He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus is telling his disciples, like, as you follow me, you need to let the love that you have received from me spill out to others as you reach out to them in love in all you do. The disciples need to let loving others become their highest priority because Jesus says, that's what following me actually looks like. And here's the thing. As, as, even though the story, this story really clearly lays out the command, we're supposed to love our neighbor. But if you notice, it doesn't give us a lot of specifics on what that looks like in the details of our lives. Right? It never tells you exactly how to love your neighbor. It doesn't tell you, you know, in, in detailed instructions on how to weigh out different priorities and how to creatively invest the time and the energy and the money and the talent, all the things that you've got. Instead, it just says, go do it. Right? Go love your neighbor. So I think that means that it's up to each one of us to invite God through the power of the Holy Spirit to help us navigate that and help us figure out, okay, well, exactly how do I love my neighbor in this situation? How do I do that in the context of my life? And over the years, I've run into a number of different times where, you know, you're in a situation, you feel like you're called to love your neighbor, you're just not quite sure what to do. And a few years ago, I heard another pastor talking, and I heard this wonderful, clarifying question. It's a question that, for me at least, as I've gone through life, when I find myself in situations where I know God's calling me to love, but I'm not quite sure what that should look like, I just stop and through the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to help me answer this question, and it has given me a very clear answer every time. You guys want to know what the question is? Let's go. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. So, so here's the question. It's really simple. What does love require of me? Right? What does love require of me? Remember, Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So you stop and you think, okay, given the love I've received from God, what is the right way to respond in love to my neighbor? And I've just found that's a really helpful question to ask, especially when you invite the Holy Spirit to help you answer it. Or when you're really confused, it can be good to invite the people that you are in Christian community with to dialogue with you about that, to help you figure out what does it look like in your situation? How do we apply the teaching of Jesus to this? But whenever I've answered this question, I've gotten a really clear, whenever I've asked this question, I've gotten a really clear answer. And I've got to tell you, I haven't always liked the answer, because sometimes Jesus asks us to do things that we don't want to do. Because some of the neighbors that I've had in my life are not particularly lovable. And I'm guessing that you know some people like that too. But just because they're jerks doesn't change the command, right? You always have to stop and ask the question, what does love require of me? So that's, that's kind of how I want to leave things, by giving you this tool, this simple question. And then what I want to do is, is actually leave you with the very same challenge that Jesus left in the lap of that expert in the law, right? Remember how it ended? He said, you need to go and you need to do likewise, Right? The teacher had to decide for himself, okay, how am I going to respond? How am I going to apply this to my life? And you know what I think is just absolutely fascinating about the way Jesus tells this story? He doesn't actually tell us what the teacher of the law do does. He doesn't tell us how he responded. Right? We don't know. Does he just blow this off and think, well, that's good news. I'm not going to do that. Or, or does he leave and really wrestle with, okay, how am I going to let what I've heard affect my life and my choices? Because he really has this decision to make. In light of what I have heard, what am I going to do? And that's the very same challenge that we have today. How are we going to live when we walk out those doors? So typically at the end of our service, what we do is I'll end the sermon with a prayer. And then we'll sing a song. And then there'll be sort of a, a final word as you go. But we're not going to do any of that today. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to end with the very same challenge that Jesus gave the teacher of the law back then. So again, think about the story. Think about those three different characters that we met, the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan. And this guy, had, the whole question started, the whole story started because he wanted to know, well, who's my neighbor? So then Jesus turns to him and he says this. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Well, it was the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. As you go into your week, may you go and do likewise.